And oh, welcome to Wednesday Night Bible Study here at Expedition Church of the Triad, located at 6302 Walter Wright Road here in the Metroplex city of Pleasant Garden, North Carolina. We are in the Piedmont Triad Metroplex. We may not be the big part of the Metroplex, but we're part of the Metroplex. Hallelujah. So we're glad to have you with us tonight. We'd love to have you come and join us in person. And uh, But until then, please continue to join us for online services, Sunday mornings at 1030 and Wednesday nights at 7 o'clock. Hallelujah. Thank you for being with us. Once again, uh, we are continuing on maintaining our faith. And we covered some things last week. I'm probably going to back up on a little bit and go, go back over. Um, hallelujah. And uh, we've talked about, you know, the importance of maintaining our faith, uh, maintaining the spirit of faith. Amen. And um, when we talk about one of the things we talked about I believe, last week big was remain teachable. You've got to stay teachable. And if we don't stay teachable, we get lifted up in pride. And when you get lifted up in pride, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before the fall. Okay? I, uh, I have seen people who are, who were excellent in ministry, who could teach extremely well, and some things that get lifted up in pride and fall off, fall off the deep end. Now, we got a major national minister now that's not even connected to people they were connected to. Because they got some new revelation and they were deep and they couldn't they couldn't take correction. You got to be able to take see teachability means you got to be able to take re, uh, correction. You got to be able to be I'm wrong. Okay, not you got a new doctrine and you were wrong about the other stuff. Somebody coming that you would consider a um, father in the Lord. Remember, we have many teachers but not many fathers. Um. I'm probably going to sit for a little while. I may get, now if I get the Holy Ghost runs and going around the room, hallelujah, I'll go with it. But anyway, until then, I'm going to sit, okay? Um, i trying to think, I started to tell you about um, a, a particular ministry at one time. Oh, we had a minister come here and, and he gained national prominence um, and was going in churches all over the country and making, I mean, he was getting big offerings private jet I mean I went to the airport and got on the jet one time got uh, me and Janie got to go down there and sit on the jet and um, they were they had a revelation and um, preached at camp meeting now if you ever get to preach a camp meeting in Tulsa back when Dad Hagen was here that was like <laughs> I mean you know a billion dollar advertising budget for your ministry he said he got back from that camp meeting and had a stack of invitations this big sitting on his desk before he could hardly get home. And everybody in the country was having him come preach because it was a, it was a it was a message, and I'm not, I, and I'm not I'm trying to destroy anybody, so I'm not going to talk about what the message was or anything. Just give you an example, and the ministry ended up being built a lot, but on by being under Brother Hagen. So, so he would he would stand on the platform, put, hang his feet off the platform, and twiddle his thumbs like Dad Hagen used to do. That was just the way Brother Hagen would do. You know, sometimes when he was teaching, he'd walk up to the edge of the platform, his toes would hang up a little bit, and he'd have his hands like this, and he would twiddle his thumbs. And he started doing it. And then when Dad Hagen would get into spirit, sometimes he'd start going. He just his tongue would get so thick from the Holy Ghost being on him. When he start, he would do that just as as a, I, you know, y'all know who my father is. Okay, but then about, I guess now, that meeting is about 20 years ago now, Brother Hagen called a, a meeting for all the major ministries that were preaching prosperity in America to come. He wanted to talk because they were starting to get into excess. Okay, they were getting out of line. And he called it, it was called Top Summit Meeting. They, and caught all these ministers that come. Um, a lot of them came. Now, some of them didn't receive even there. But this particular minister said, I'm not going. The Lord told me it hurt my faith. Now, wait a second. You built your whole ministry based on following after Brother Hagin's ministry. 
And now that a corrective thing is taking place, that's going to hurt your faith. And um, what happened in that meeting, Brother Hagin um, brought everybody in to say, listen, guys, he sat them all down, big conference table, they're in the conference room out there, got them all in, sat them down, and said, had, had a stack of notebooks. He said, you guys are not teaching anything new. Of course, they all thought they had some new revelation on prosperity. He said they were teaching this in the 50s. I said, he said, and I got the notes right here. He kept all the notes from the different meetings he sat on people teaching prosperity. He said, and it got into excess and it killed the move of God. And I determined not to let that happen. He wanted to bring balance, not compromise, but balance and take away the excess that would end up hurting the move of God. Okay? And one of the pe ministers that he, that did, another one that didn't come, but claim, you know, through Brother Copeland claimed allegiance to Dad Hagen and stuff. I, I, it irritates when people bro quote Brother Hagen and then turn around because it, it gives them a, a wedge and then turn around and around disagree with him without saying who he was. You know? Okay, but, well, Brother Hagen said, but then later on, and I, I went, this minister said this, and I know who it was. Because he asked him in the meeting, have you ever received a hundredfold? Well, I believe I have. So he's trying to, trying to make a confession of faith that he had. Okay? And um, I say that's not teachable. When that which you call your spiritual father brings correction and you won't even listen to him, are you teachable? If it's only, you know, I mean, seriously, the Lord told me not to go. It hurt my faith. Well, how did it hurt your faith? How's it going to hurt your faith? If he gives you word in the Bible that brings correction, the word of God is profitable for instruction. Amen. In righteousness, for reproof, for rebuke. Amen. For, I mean, for doctrine, for reproof, for rebuke, and instruction in righteousness. Now analyze that scripture for a second. How many things are positive? Now think, think about it now. And just from, the, from our, our thinking standpoint. Doctrine, reproof, rebuke, and instruction in righteousness. How many are positive? What's well, doctrine and instruction in righteousness? How many are negative? Reproof and rebuke. Isn't that right? Now, the ultimate end should be positive. But there you go. See, we always, if we don't, if it's not all hunkadory and, you know, we're at the happy, clappy church doing hula hoop dances with sunshades on and everything, there's never, ever, 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 ever anything that's negative. Like, you're wrong. Hello? Then we don't want to listen to it. Or, as a general, that's what happens. So, if we're going to remain teachable, we have to be submitted to those over us in the Lord and those that we call fathers. That doesn't mean they're always right, but you need to listen and be challenged to prove what you're saying is right versus, I'm not going, it's going to hurt my faith. Now, see, I, I can't walk with people like that. I don't want to be around them. Because the spirit's wrong. You know? They want to talk about submission and authority and all this stuff and then turn around. They're not either one. They have no submission in their life. Y'all here, you go home. See, a lot of times uh, ministries get so big. Uh, there, was, there was a national denominational minister, huge television ministry. Uh, which in turn became, was a huge man. He could, had a big church in, his, his, in uh, his particular denomination and then traveled and did big crusades and had huge television following. Well, if you were listening to any church events 30 years ago, he fell into sin. Adultery. Having a um, hiring strippers. <laughs> Isn't that lovely? I wasn't being serious there. That was a, that was a sarcastic lovely. <laughs> Got outed by another ministry in his own denomination 
who actually got in trouble himself for some of the same things because they were in competition. Okay? And um, so his conference <laughs> didn't punish him. I mean, when I say punish, didn't bring him in for correction and, I mean, take him out of the pulpit for a season, et cetera, for, to be restored. And I, think, I think they had to have him, had him like a month or something, not, not preach. If you're living like doing that kind of stuff for, for some type of extended period of time, one month ain't going to fix it. Okay? Boy, I'm going to just wallow over here and step in all kinds of mess tonight. I can only see where I'm heading. Okay? And then the national headquarters got wind of how the conference took care of it, and they said, no, you're off the air for two years. You get your life together. So you, you can't minister like you're like that way. And he turned in his papers because his ministry was too big. Too big to come off the air. See? Well, how are you, you know, how are you going to receive from someone who's got that going on in life and they're not getting restored and getting things straight? And then something else ha again happened not too much longer after that. He fell back in some other things saying he had been free, but he was back in them again. It don't, it don't work that way. He, ne he needed to be away from the power, the glamour, the glitz, and the money for a season until he got healed up, restored. Hello? I said, hello? So, I mean, and, yeah, do ministers fall? Yeah. Happens all the time. And they need to be restored. But my, my point is, on this right now is, but they can't get into a place that they're too big to be corrected. Because the ministry's too big. It's never that big. God's always got somebody. I said, God's always got somebody. We can't afford to let that go down. Look at how many lives are being touched. You're saying that God's not big enough to handle a change of venue in, the, in who's ministering? Mm -mm. So, but on the smaller scale, which is your life and, you know, so forth, you need to stay teachable. I was listening to a tape um, of Brother Hagin sharing something, and he shared a story that I knew very well because I was there when it happened. I was at Ramah. And a, a minister came in, very well known, one I highly respect, and even though he's gone home to be with Jesus, highly respect. And he was he was doing a week seminar at Ramah. <laughs> I'm telling you, the people we had to come to Ramah when I was there is like the who's who of word of faith. <clears throat> I'm serious. I mean, let's see, we had Fred Price, Kenneth Copeland, um, Demas Shakirian. Um, Lester Summerall, Jerry Savelle, Vicki Jameson. Oh, gosh. I mean, it just went on and on and on and on. Every time I was there, there was one of those people there at school ministering. You're thinking, wow. <laughs> just line them up. They're the, they're the uh, Word of Faith All-Star team. I mean, I'm serious. That's how it was the whole year. But this minister said something while he was preaching, and I went, Wow. I don't, I, I, didn't, I didn't agree with that. But I let it go. You know, I'm, I'm a young Ramah student. I don't know everything. I'm like, these people know more than me. So the next week after the seminar, was our brother Hagen got up in, um, in uh, Share and Praise. He would, you know, he, he'd come in, and he didn't always speak in that. Actually, he didn't always come. But he got, he, I guess he wanted to say something. <laughs> and so he got up because it was the whole school at the, in the auditorium at the same time. <clears throat> and he says, now, and he, he didn't talk but about a couple seconds and he stopped and he jumped into this. He said, I want y'all to know something. Last week, brother so-and-so ministered and said something I thoroughly disagreed with. That's how brother Hagin would talk. I thoroughly disagreed with. He said, but 15 minutes later, 
He said something that gave me an answer to something I've been praying about for 15 years. <laughs> I'm like, that's a big lesson for me because I heard what he said and I didn't agree with it. He said, eat the hay and leave the stubble. He said, if I had shut him off when he said that, I'd have missed my answer. So we have to stay teachable. Amen? So even if the person says something that we can't really agree with, don't shut them down, especially like if they're your pastor, your spiritual father. <clears throat> eat the hay and leave the stubble. If it's stubble to you, spit it out and go on and eat the hay. <coughs> and um, I was listening to one of his tape series the other night, and he told that story. And I'm like, I know who it was, and I know what he said. <laughs> Hallelujah. I know exactly what he said. And it had to do with the rapture. And, um, you know, anyway, so being teachable, we cannot take the attitude that we know everything. That shoe don't that, that shoe don't fit. Amen. What is it? That something don't fish. What is that state? That's like saying something don't fish. Huh? Dog won't hunt. Uh, boat won't float. Um, you know, something won't fish. Something. There's, there's all kinds of little sayings like that. Okay. Too thin to make soup. Okay. All right. So, don't be. A non-teachable believer. Now, when I think about who Brother Hagin was, where he was in his ministry, been praying about something in the Bible, something he was trying to understand for 15 years. And right before the person who was speaking gave him that answer, he said something he disagreed with. But he just let that go and kept listening. Amen. So stay teachable. Amen. And then I think we kind of dabbled around this next one last week is stay around people of like precious faith. It is so important that you have a group of people that you spend time, spend the better part of your time with that are of like precious faith. like precious faith amen why because if you hang around the wrong people well we've been friends for years yeah but they're they're full of unbelief and don't believe nothing like you believe they mock you when you talk about i've over that tongue talking church you don't have to say that. You can just say Pentecostal or charismatic, and they'll give you the look. You might raise the eyebrow. Okay? And then they'll start talking to you about, I remember, I remember our neighbor, uh, when, we, when we came to Greensboro, we bought our first house. And our neighbor, they were nice people. Um, I'm not, somebody visits here, it's his dad. <laughs> okay? And uh, right next door to us, he came over one day, and we got to talking. He just started talking about um, them Pentecostals, them tongue-talking people. And after, and he, I guess he saw the look on my face. <laughs> he, he went, you're not one of them, are you? I said, yeah. <laughs> and boy, he backtracked. <laughs> yeah, I'm one of them. Hallelujah. And he didn't know what to do except wrap that one up and go home and come back another day and just have a different discussion. He never talked about it again. <laughs> I mean, he knew he had stepped in a hole, a sinkhole. He was over his, he was underwater. And I didn't go, well, you know, man. I just, yeah, I'm one of them. Yeah. Tongue talking, we hear it. <laughs> Okay, um, <clears throat> those we hang around greatly influence life. The Bible says iron sharpens iron. 
How could two walk together except they be agreed? Now, I am not going to deny fellowship with a non-spirit-filled believer. If they're born again, I will fellowship with them, but I'm not going to spend all my time hanging out with them. Okay? Why? Because I, because I need strength to maintain, to maintain my strength in the things of God. And the, you know, like Sunday. Now, I'm not going to go hang around a pastor who disagrees with everything that happened here Sunday <coughs> and tells me that I all passed away the day the last apostle died. And that was the flesh and it was the devil and you got demon spirits in your church and all that. I ain't hanging around them. No, I'm not going I'm not gonna tell them I won't you know, you know, talk to them. I had I, one time I had a pastor turn his back on me. I was I was I'd been on asked to, what in the world? Who are you calling me in the middle of a church service? That's why I stopped bringing my phone to the pulpit with the stupid watch clutch got on it. Um We've been on Ask the Pastor, when we had that TV station here, I got, we went to Ask the Pastor together a couple of times, and he was pretty harsh on uh, my comments. And uh, when I saw him out at, at a clothing store one day, he was trying on clothes, and, and I said, hey, brother, you know, you know well, that's it. And he turned his back on me, wouldn't even talk to me. Hello. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to do that to another pastor, even though he doesn't believe like we do. I'm not going to do it. Because he is my brother in Christ. We may, dis we not, may not see eye to eye on the infilling of the Holy Ghost, and et cetera, but I'm not going to treat him with disdain. However, I'm not going to spend all my time with him either. I'm going to go find me a pastor or a minister who believes like me. We can sharpen each other and encourage one another, strengthen one another. Amen? But however, if I was... Walked into, oh, I don't know, Freddy's. And he was sitting there and said, hey, brother, how you doing? Well, come sit with us. You know, I'd do it. Wouldn't feel like I got the cooties or anything. Okay? I mean, I wouldn't get up and bind the devils and cast them out and anoint me with oil as I walk out the door. That, them unbelieving devils and stuff. I'm mature enough that that's not going to affect me. But I'm not going to spend all my time with them. Why? Because those who aren't rising up to a certain place and don't want to, if you hang around them all the time, they'll pull you down. They'll pull you down. And it's one thing if you're ministering and you're trying to pull them up, but I can't spend all my time there if all they're doing is telling me how wrong I am and they have no interest in going another direction. Where am I going to go? Well, the Bible says when they, when, they, when they were threatened, you know, in the book of Acts, when they were threatened and taught, told to preach no more in the name of Jesus, what does it say they did? They went to their own company. They went to their own company. Amen? And reported all that the chief priests and elders said, Brother Bill, you were fast on that one. He knew where I was going ahead of time. <laughs> all the chief priests and elders said unto them, yeah, thought you knew that. Hallelujah. Let's see if I can get there faster than him. I'm going to get there before Brother Bill. Okay. And when they heard that, they lifted up the voice. What? Their own company. So they had been told not to preach in the name of Jesus. They had been told, you know, be, you know, straightly charged not to teach in that name. And they lifted up the voice in one accord with God and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth. And the sea and all that's in them, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage <clears throat> and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood, stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth, against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod <coughs> and Pontius Pilate, and the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do, Whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before it to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, 
the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. Now what? You, they, this is the same bunch that got filled with their Pentecost. They got refilled by going to their own company and hanging around with their own, those who believed like they did, they got a fresh infilling. And we need fresh infillings. We need to be stirred. We need to stir one another. Amen? You need to be able to, when you say, uh, I'm dealing with some really uh, tough stuff here. I need, I need help. That the person talking to you is a person of faith that will feed you faith, that will stir your faith, that will agree with your faith. The last person you need in that time is brother or sister unbelief that goes, well, you never know why the Lord's doing what he's doing. He's got a reason that you don't understand. Hello? And we'll pray. Oh, God, help my dear brother or my dear sister bear up under this weight of oppression you've placed on their life. This thing you sent to teach them, break them, mold them through suffering and agony and pain. And Lord, you choose not to deliver them. I pray that they'll be able to you know, bear up as long as they can. I think I would slap them halfway through it and tell them to shut up. Don't be praying for me no more. This is why I don't get on Facebook and blab to the whole world, pray for me. Because I don't need that kind of prayer. If I'm going to share I need prayer, it's going to add on the church thing because I've taught you. I know what y'all believe because I've taught you. Hello. Or I got Raymond friends and pastors. I know. I know what they believe. They ain't going to give me no unbelieving belief, believing. Hello? I mean, you know, if they ask a question, usually if somebody says, well, what is it you're believing for? Well, I'm believing, okay. Well, I can agree with you. See, what, what happens when they say that? I know that they know what they're doing because they, they don't just want to pray, and, you know, praying hands on Facebook. <laughs> what exactly does that mean? Have you ever asked yourself that? What, the, what are you praying? I'd like to know how you want to pray. Because if you're not going to pray this way, just take somebody else. Leave me out of it. Let's, no, 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 no. I need to be around people of like precious faith. You need to be around people of like precious faith. We need to be, when we are facing things, and the attack has come. And maybe we're down. You don't need Debbie Downer to help you go further. You don't need to get with Job's friends and hang out and get more depressed. Hello? I mean, Job's friends got in there and got his wife involved. Job ain't got nobody helping him out. They're all just filling him up with unbelief. Hello? And you don't need that. You need, I mean, a faith tigger. Come bouncing in there. You got this. You're full of faith in the Holy Ghost. Your faith, I, I tell people now a lot of times when, I, when I'm, they're dealing with something, and, and, I, and I, do this, I say this, I'm praying for you because Jesus said this. I, I can, it's good enough for Jesus. It's good enough for me. I've prayed for thee, that thy faith fail thee not. I believe your faith is strong. I believe your faith wins. I believe you overcome by faith. Amen? Your faith is strong enough to face this battle and win. Amen? Encouraging. Instead of, what did you do wrong? Are you in sin now? This is stuff people say all the time. Or, Lord, 
extend your healing mercies. But if not, well, how can you? There's no faith in that. You know, if it be thy will, heal our dear brother. Well, I tell you what I do know. They didn't read the Bible. What do you mean? Because Jesus is our healer. He bore our sickness and carried our disease. 1 Peter 2.24 says, Who his own self bear our sin and his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sin should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name, in my name, they'll speak with new tongues. They'll cast out devils. They'll take up serpents. If they drink any deadly thing, it shall not harm them. And they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power, who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For what? For God was with them. Acts chapter 10, verse 48, 38. I don't need you going. You quoting the scripture, Old Testament, misinterpreted, you know. Set your house in order, for today thou shalt surely die. Oh, my God. That was not a word to the entire nation of Israel. The prophet came and spoke, and then the person got up and repented for stuff, asked God for more time. He gave him 15 more years. All right? You can't quote that over everybody on the planet. Yeah. Or you never know what the Lord's going to do. I heard one minister one time say on, they had a big radio ministry. Now, we have seen the Lord gloriously heal. And we don't know why. And he just went on about how God is sovereign. He can, he can, and most of the time, he don't. We don't understand why he does sometimes. Most of the time, he's dead. I remember Norval Hayes said, now, if y'all don't know who Norval Hayes is, that, that, that was Norval. There was nobody like Norval. Noble soul alive. Okay, I thought he had passed away. And um, in his particular denomination, they had, a, they had a chalkboard. And it was the prayer board. And when somebody in the church got sick, they wrote their name up for everybody to pray for. And after uh, growing up there, and after a few times of, of, of beginning to observe this as he was growing up, everybody whose name got on that board died. And his prayer became, <laughs> Jesus, don't ever let my name get on the, on the chalkboard of the such and such church. <laughs> wow, he knew he was toast if it got on there. They're going to pray right into the grave. Nobody ever got healed. So you're thinking, I mean, anybody with an, any kind of analytical mind going, name on board, dead. There's no hope. Because these people are praying right out of faith and into the ground. And Brother Bill knows because he's in one of those churches. <laughs> and again, I, I, I'm not trying to be, so I'm not trying to be ugly. That's why I'm not calling and uh, saying what na denomination the name because we're not trying to um, be a superior. However, I'm telling you for your well-being and your strength and, your, and, and maintaining your faith, you need to be around people of like precious faith. Amen. Who are excited about the Word of God. Yeah. Now, as we're growing, we're going we're gonna to find out we didn't know everything. I think I found that out recently. But anyway, now I've known for a long time I don't know everything. Amen? Or I hadn't seen some things in a certain light that when I was around somebody else of like precious faith, it opened my eyes, and I went, oh, wow, look at that. And it stirred me. Amen? Because they, they, they said it. Or they taught it or they minister it in a way that 
I went, man, I didn't see it that way before. It takes me up to another level. Okay? Because what? Iron sharpens iron. Okay? The process of sharpening iron sharpens both of them. We get better. We grow more. Amen. Now, if you've got a friend whose mission is to get you out of this church, you probably shouldn't hang around them a whole lot. My mission in life, do, 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 is to get you out of that church. Them people are crazy over there. I've heard about them Pentecostals. They hang from the chandelier. It's tough. They don't have any in here. They roll on their pews. You can't roll under our chairs. They stand on the back. If you stand on the back of these, you'll fall over. They're not, kneeling, they're not screwed to the floor. They roll out the front door of the church. We could do that. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, let me say this. As you hang around people of like precious faith, and you continue to grow, stay in church, get fed the Word of God, flow in the Spirit, and maintain that those things you're learning, what will happen is people will begin to notice. They'll begin to notice the difference of how you live. And there's been many a time that people have come back that were adamantly against them being in a Pentecostal charismatic church and said, you know, and I don't. I still don't understand that. You know, a lot of times I say, say this term that 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 tongue business. But I have to admit, since you since you've gotten there and gotten uh, going going to church there, I've watched you. You're living a better life. There's something about you that's uh, more committed, to, dedicated, consecrated to God. I've watched you. Now, I still don't understand them tongues, but they, they can't say anything against it anymore. Amen? Because you continue to, to stay and maintain your level of faith and walk with God and commitment to God. Amen? So um, when you're surrounded by people who talk and walk faith, it keeps you sharp. Now, in my current situation, you know, pastoring, being a district director for Rama, and working a full-time job, hello, I mean, sometimes I feel like our theme song is, I'm Bumba Way, in the jungle, the mighty jungle, the lion's thieves tonight, and then they wake up. Uh, <coughs> hallelujah. I mean, there are days. <laughs> anyway, I don't get to go as many meetings as I would like to. Okay? I don't get to get back to Tulsa like I'd like to. Um, getting to a meeting with somebody um, that, that's going to really minister and feed me, is, it's, it's harder because we just can't get away and go do it. And, um, but I was able to go back, back in May and go see Mark Hankins down in uh, South Carolina. And man, that was refreshing. That was stirring and refreshing just to be around that spirit of faith. You know, I mean, it just, just did all kinds of stuff in that one, one service. Amen. Stuff that a tape doesn't do for you. Okay? It, it's not doing it for you. But thank God we have those people we can we can connect with and, mi and get ministered to by. Um, actually, the Lord spoke to me while I was there and said, you need to get more connected. So one of my plans is to get to his camp meeting. You know, it's, it's great to go into the churches, you know, but you know, when you've got a camp meeting and you've got everybody there that is on the same page, you know, um, so we're going to figure out how to get there. I'm not leaving Rhema. I'm not going to de decrease with Rhema. We're going to camp meeting next year. Jesse Kepper having hands laid on them next year at Tulsa. Uh, they're, or they're ordained, but they're going to have hands laid on them 
in, you know, in, that, in that service. So we're going out to Tulsa. Now, if you want to come out, or you can watch it on TV because they'll have it, they'll have it on TV. Um, they brought they, they streamed their services. So if you want to fly out to Tulsa and come be in the service, come on. We tell you, tell you the best places to eat. Amen. You can go to Oral Roberts to see the praying hands. It's about ten miles from Rama. You know, you can see what was the old city of faith. You know, so so if you want to go to Tulsa next summer during that week, come on. He, I, I just said, there's a connection there of, of spiritual things that I want to be around because it stirs you up. I said, it stirs you up. I can tell you if you hang around people who've been baptized in lemon juice and vinegar, you'll look like it in a few days. <laughs> and you hear him going, well, God is good. I think. And you used to be God is a good God. Hallelujah. Now it's a maybe. I mean, old Robert, what old Roberts used to say? Something good is going to happen to you today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Those things that have been deposited into you in your life. Those spiritual deposits. For some, they're laying there dormant, but they're there. Hallelujah. Waiting. Waiting for the time that God raises that out and pulls that out. I, uh, the Lord showed me one time. Actually, I had Mark Brzee in here. Back in our in the the not even in the business park, back in the metal warehouse down on Lee Street. That's where the church was when we came to Greensboro and took it. And um, <laughs> he said, "There are deposits," and I, and I could see it in the spirit. I knew what he was talking about. There are deposits in you. God's going to pull them out at the right time, the right season. Well, I start thinking back. See, growing up Pentecostal, boy, you had the old. Anybody ever been in a Pentecostal church? I'm not talking about, I mean, it was old time Pentecostal church. Okay. We prayed every Wednesday night. You went to the altar willingly or drugged, but you went to the altar. And they put all the kids up front. You're on the kneeling pad at the altar. And the old saints would come by and slap their hand on your head and start praying. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you went out in the spirit or you got knocked over, we didn't know. Because they, they, they put their hand on And I could still hear the voice of Brother Paramore as a young boy, not even saved, <laughs> I mean, not even serving God, put his hands on my head. Oh, God, use this young man for your glory. And for your, I could still hear his voice. Well, see, he was old enough to have come in on the tail at that time. Lord, was, I think he was two days older than dirt when he was doing that, and that's back in the sixties. So he was around for the early early years of Pentecost, coming out of the Susan Street era. They pray those those old saints would pray things over you. I mean, you grab a hold of the altar. I'm, I'm hanging on to the world right now. You're doing everything you can, and they're shaking you with heaven. God's making deposits. Hallelujah. And then you get saved. And I mean, different ministries lay hands on you. Then I go to Rama. You know, and we got Dad Hagen, and we've got, I mean, oh gosh, so many. I lost count of these old ministers that were laying hands on us. And they were releasing spiritual deposits into our lives. I've shared with you before how that we were, we were at um, 1982 Alumni Week at Rama. See, what am I talking about? I, mean, listen, I, know I speak from a ministry standpoint a lot of times because that's my experience because that's, you know, 
but it's still applicable to your life. Okay? About being around people of light, precious faith. Well, Brother Copeland ministered that night at Alumni Week. This is back before we had, um, you know, like winter Bible seminar and camp meeting. We had Alumni Week. All the alumni would come back. And they would stack the meeting. In that particular meeting, Brother Hagen, T.O. Osborne, and Brother Copeland ministered. Not a bad lineup. So Janie and I, somehow, I, it must have been God, had been God, because we would stand out line for two hours to get in. And we got seats right behind the Hagens and the Copelands. They're on the front row. We're right behind them. Like, we're Ellie sitting, and Rita in between there. We're sitting, and Brother Hagen and Sister Hagen, Gloria, and Brother Copeland. They're right in front of us. Janie's checking out Gloria's toes <laughs> to see what kind of sandals and toenail polish she has on. <laughs> Honey, are you kidding me? <laughs> <coughs> and then Brother Copeland ministered that night. And we're all standing up at the end of the service, and he, he steps over and begins to prophesy about the glory of God that's coming on the earth. And um, we're all standing, and he walks over, and he looks. Kenneth Copeland has the bluest eyes of anybody I've ever seen. Because he's looking those beady eyes right into mine. And he's prophesying about this coming glory. And he looks at me, and he takes his hand, and he puts it right on my cheek, and says, and you and I, We'll see it together. Because about that time, I'm going, yeah, boom. Not backwards, sideways, right down, because he puts he just, yeah, boom. Brother Summerall, before he passed, a year before he passed away, um, we ended up in California, and ended up, he was doing a meeting with Ed Dufresne out there. And so we took part of the trip that we planned and canceled it and went to the meeting. Mark Mazzee was there, Ed Dufresne was there. Uh, Lester Summerall was ministering. And Brother Summerall had said he was going to as many ministers' meetings as he could get to because he wanted to deposit in the ministers before he went home. He was planning to go home. Yeah. He had already planned. He was going home. His wife had died. He's ready to go home. So before he left, he wanted to impart. Because remember, Wigglesworth laid hands on him and made a deposit. And so. Uh, in that meeting, he's, he's laying hands on us. Call, call people to come down to the front. If you're a minister, come down. I want to lay hands on you. And the people get there. He said, no, I said if you're a minister. If you're not a minister, this is not for you. We're imparting to ministers. I mean, I got knocked like a, two by, like a baseball bat upside the head. Then Brother Ed ministered. And um, it's stirred. It's kept. It's helped me maintain my faith. These deposits made by men of God who carry an anointing, who, carry, who are carriers of the anointing. Like Elijah, you know, Elisha wanted his mantle, a double portion, but that they were carriers of the anointing. And that was passed on. Not necessarily the same calling, but the anointing. When you hang around people of like precious faith, see, they're car they're 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 carriers of the anointing of faith and, and you know, the, the word of faith, the spirit of faith. And when you're around them, it gets on you. It'll get on you. So what do we do? Don't think naturally. Think spiritually. I need to be around people who are going to help my faith and strengthen my faith and be hungry for it. Oh, be hungry for it. Oh, my. Oh, my. Brother Hagen's last meeting. Well, his last meeting out he, in uh, May of 2004, uh, five, whatever. I forgot what year it was um, when he went to home be with the Lord. In May of that year, he did the Winston-Salem meeting. 2003. Okay, so yeah, it was 20 years ago. Yeah, 23 years ago. May of, 20, of 2023, he was at. Uh, J.B. J.C. Hatch is over in Winston. And he did that meeting, and um, at that time, Brother Hagen would go down the line, and lay hands on people, and you know, I mean, you have people falling out in the spirit all over the place. And he was coming up the aisle, and I was on the end. 
I just had this sudden urge. As he got close, I stepped over. Nathan was like 10. And I swung him around beside me. And Brother Hagan laid hands on him. Because I wanted him. Brother Hagan's already laid hands on me. I'd already been in service as Brother Hagan laid hands. But I wanted my son to have that. He was the closest one I'd get my hands on. And the girls were further down. They both went to Raymond now, so they're, they're all good. <laughs> Pushed him over. Well, that night, he got saved and went to the prayer room, got filled with the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. In that service. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, a point he could say, yes, that was the point I know, you know. And um, there's a deposit there now. And there's a deposit placed in him. Amen. Well, see, now when, we, when, when I'm ministering, we have all these deposits that have been placed in my ministry, my spirit, that God will pull out and place on people that I lay hands on. Be around faith. I, I know people who would get filled with the Holy Spirit, speak in tongues, and then stay in their non-tongue-talking church. Keep all their same friends and never really grow or achieve to the place they really needed to because they, ne they didn't change anything. Some of you start going, well, uh, I want to get all these people filled with the Holy Ghost. You're not going to do it staying in a place to teach against it. When the pastor gets up and says, we don't believe in that, you know, now you got this, you got division in the church because you got maybe this little, this little uh, prayer group that's going to get everybody filled and the pastor gets up saying, we don't believe in that and setting them at odds. Well, it's hard to, hard to be sharpened and iron in that, you know, I love you, brother, but don't you, don't, don't you be talking about none of that, that, uh, Glossolalia stuff with me. Hello? Them babblings. I ain't interested. Okay. All righty. Or, no, I mean, not just feeling the whole, feeling, feeling with the Holy Ghost. You start talking about believing in healing, believing in prosperity, believing God actually does what He said in His Word He would do. Well, you think Christians would, would be, yeah, God said that. We, we were, uh, my church, I'm, I'm going to finish up right here. Is that okay if I finish up right here? It's not going to be, eight, you're going to be done before 8 o'clock. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. What, Lord, you want me to go longer? No. <laughs> um, we, we, we got a softball team at our, at, at Faith and Victor Church in Greenville. We got us together. We're going to play in the, the summer league, church league, the church league. Softball. Put us a team together. It was bad. I'm the only one on there who knew how to play ball. And they wanted to, everybody to be equitable. And one night I got, and the pastor got on me and said, look, don't do that. I am a Mr. Hustle award winner playing ball. That's how, that, I, two years of my high school senior year, two times all conference, Mr. Hustle. I was Pete, that was the Pete Rose of my high school team. I'd run through the fence. I'd run over people. I mean, bowl the catcher every chance I got. If he got me out, he was going to go out. That's how I played ball. I would just lower the shoulder and just bowl him. You know, see how far back toward the backstop I could put him. I might be out, but I had a lot of pleasure. And so I'm out playing the outfield. Uh, I was, that's what I was, an outfielder. I was an outfielder. I loved the outfield. could run. I could throw. When Little League, I threw the ball over the, back, over the press conference booth from center field at the fence and just shot. I was going home and, and threw the ball, and it went over a two-story press conference box. It just sailed. And our catch was like this. <laughs> anyway. So ball was hit, had to run on the third. I'm coming in. I got it, I got it, I got it. I cut the guy off because he was coming up, caught the ball, threw it home, and the guy didn't run. He got upset. You're supposed to let me try and catch the ball. You can't throw. There's a guy on third. 
I didn't come here to play church ball and, you know, walk in love and all that stuff. I came here to win. We can walk in love at the end of the game. Love you. How you doing? Bless you. God bless you. So forth. And the guy, the third base coach, the person playing third for our team, that they heard the third base coach tell the runner, he said, if the other guy had caught the ball, I was going to send you home, but I won't let you run on him. Okay. <clears throat> so we're playing ball one night, and then w one of our players goes into the second base and gets hurt. Now, we're, we're charismatic word of faith church. We don't leave them there hurting going, call the rescue squad. We're, laying there, we're going down there and lay hands on them in Jesus' name. And one of the other team's players said, walked off and said, I ain't going to have nothing to do with that junk. Okay, brother. Call us if you need it. Any healing power or something. And um, we know about our business. That's not who you need to hang around. When they start calling, laying hands on the sick, junk. It's not junk. It's a holy ordinance of God. You shall lay hands on the sick. From the mouth of the head of the church, the Lord Jesus Christ himself, you shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. Amen? Amen? All right. So what are you going to do? You're going to do what? Okay, let's try to get it together. You're going to... Thank you. Amen. All right, let's receive the offering and go home. Hallelujah. And if you don't have many of them, get some tape series of people of like precious faith and listen to them. You, uh, you got YouTube now. That's right. You got the Victory Channel on, um, on Spectrum. What, it's, what channel is that? 472. Okay. I mean, they got Bill Winston on there. They got Kenneth Copeland. They've got... Uh, I think Jesse Duplantis is on there. Um, Keith Butler. Love Keith Butler. Bishop Butler. I'm Bishop Keith Butler. <laughs> yeah. I can't even, I can't even com imitate Keith Butler because the type of raspy, uh, pitchy voice he has. But it goes from bass to yes. <laughs> you know. All right. Father, in Jesus' name, we bless the people. We tithe, give, and sow into the kingdom of God. We thank you. You open heaven's windows unto them, and pour them out blessings they don't have room enough to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Send your electronic giving. Give your uh, in-house offering. Praise the Lord. All righty. Amen. And I lied. We're 45 seconds past 8 o'clock. <laughs> Remember these words, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world, and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. See you next time here at Expedition Church of the Triad. Love you.